Good morning. I'm Josh Lipsky, Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center, and welcome to today's event, New Rules for Stablecoins and the Future of Payments. Over the past year, the landscape around digital assets has shifted. First, the collapse of Terra Luna, followed by the debacle at FTX, have raised new questions around digital currencies and regulatory frameworks. But throughout all of these changes, there has been one constant, bipartisan interest in providing more clarity and guidelines around stablecoins. This is an effort that began in the last Congress under then House Financial Services Committee Chair Maxine Waters and has continued into this Congress under Chairman Patrick McHenry. It is an issue which impacts not only the U.S., but also the global economy. Currently, there are over 200 stable coins in circulation around the world, with an estimated total value of over $130 billion. That's larger than the GDP of over 100 countries. So this is systemically important. As the issuer of the dollar, the U.S. has a unique role to play. That's because approximately 98% of all stablecoins are pegged to the U.S. dollar. Our work at the Atlantic Council, through our trackers and research, has demonstrated the rapid acceleration in the adoption of digital assets around the world, both central bank digital currencies and stablecoins. In both of these areas, there is a need to understand what rules will be put in place. How will consumers be protected? What type of redemption provisions and liquidity standards do stablecoin issuers need to meet? Who can issue these stablecoins? Banks, non-banks, others. What about the role of the state versus federal government in licensing? What oversight and enforcement measures will be in place? How do we create a safe digital asset ecosystem while encouraging innovation? The answer to those questions is now a major focus for Congress and the House Financial Services Committee. This morning, we are honored to host two distinguished members of Congress whom both serve on the House Financial Services Committee. I'm joined today by Congressman French Hill of Arkansas, Vice Chair of the House Financial Services Committee, and Chair of the Subcommittee on Digital Assets, Financial Technology, and Inclusion. He also serves on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Welcome, Congressman. Glad to be with you. I'm also joined by Congressman Jim Hines of Connecticut, who serves on the House Financial Services Committee. During the last Congress, Congressman Himes was chairman of the Subcommittee on National Security, International Development, and Monetary Policy, and he currently is the ranking member on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Welcome, Congressman Himes. Thanks for having me. I'm joined as well today by my colleague Ananya Kumar, Associate Director for Digital Currency at the Atlantic Council, who will share some of our latest research in the field. First, Congressman, I want to turn to you both. Congressman Hill, I'm going to start with you. Question on everyone's mind. One substance, one process. On the substance, what are the goals? What are the main objectives you're trying to achieve? I outlined some of the issues in my opening. How do you try to answer those questions with the latest draft of the legislation? And on the process, when can we expect movement in committee on the bill? Right. Well, first, uh, thanks for having Jim and I to join you today to talk about this important topic. And as you say, it's not only an important topic here in the United States, but it's an, an important topic around the, around the world as it relates to economics, uh, financial policy, and just uh, the future of Web3, the future of essentially what's next uh, for, the, for the Internet. Well, first on substance, we think there's two steps that the United States needs to take, and both require a law, not a regulatory proposal. So we believe we need a stable coin regime that effectively de defines what is stable so that you can have a dollar-based stable coin and have confidence uh, in its composition, how it's regulated, how it can be used in a, in a digital tokenized payment infrastructure. And then secondly, I believe you've highlighted uh, the collapse of, of FTX, I think opens up uh, the question of the entire regulatory framework of how one treats digital assets generally, uh, not payment stable coins, but beyond that into digital assets, uh, the tokenization of of existing securities is one topic, or NFTs is a topic, and, and so those are brought even uh, uh, decentralized finance is even a broader topic. But just the regulatory framework of what's a commodity, what's a security, how are they traded, and how do dealers uh, operate, and how are all those uh, regulated for safety and soundness for any money laundering and the like. So that's process, and as to timing, uh, Chairman McHenry and, uh, and Ranking Member Waters are discussing this in earnest, but we hope to try to bring both those uh, two concept bills to the House Financial Services Committee and to the House Ag Committee in the case of the framework bill before the end of uh, July. Great. 
Thank you. That's very helpful and appreciate you flagging also the regulatory framework issues. In addition to the stablecoin right. legislation, we had news last week from Ripple that I think generated some questions, and I'm sure we'll get to that when we get to the Q&A. Congressman Himes, to you, where do you stand on the legislation? What else do you need to see between now and the bill moving forward in committee? Well, um, first, thanks to the Atlantic Council and to uh, my good friend Congressman Hill uh, for, for, for participating in this. Um, so uh, I, think, I think French got it exactly right. This is, in a polarized Congress, an example of, uh, of legislation that, um, that actually has a lot of bipartisan support. Not to say that we're sort of ready to, to vote something onto the floor yet. There's still some issues that remain to be hammered out. Um, but, but, I, but I think it's really interesting because it's, it's a fascinating moment in the sphere of digital assets, right? I was, I was a technology banker in 1999, <laughs> and for me, it's, it's a really good analogy. I mean, there was so much nonsense in 1999, so much money lost in investments and ideas that ultimately proved uh, crazy. Um, the firm I worked at, Goldman Sachs, dumped a billion dollars into a company called Webvan, which did not survive. Uh, <laughs> don't remember the uh, name of that. It's meeting with, uh, with reality. Um, and, and, and I'll be very candid, I'm, I'm a huge skeptic that we are going to live in a world of massively fragmented digital currencies. I mean, if you look at Europe, the trend in the, on the globe is towards the move of integrated, holistic global currencies, whether you're talking about Venmo or Alipay or, or the, the, the euro. Uh, nonetheless, that doesn't matter what I think, right? Um, none of us can predict exactly where this is going to go. And so what our job is to do right now is to make sure um, that, uh, that, that we, A, don't get left behind by other jurisdictions, as I fear we may be doing uh, with respect to Europe right now in terms of setting uh, the rules of the road, uh, and B, to be open-minded about what may happen here. I, I did a lot of work in the last Congress on CBDC, which has become controversial for all, for all the good reasons. Um, but, it, but, but again, um, I, I think now is the time, even though I don't think anything is particular, you said systemic, I, I, I don't agree with that, right? We, in the last 18 months, we saw the obliteration of $2 trillion in value uh, in the broader digital asset sphere, and you know, none of us got called upon to vote on bailout legislation or to fundamentally rethink the, 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 the structure. Um, so, so that's good news in the sense that it is early days. People obviously have experienced pain and bad things like FTX happened, but we, we, we need to get there soon to make sure that wherever this thing goes, it does so in a way that is sort of safe and, and predictable and transparent for, yeah. for users of the system. No, that's very helpful and appreciate your point on systemic. I also appreciate the work you did on CBDCs. We're going to get to that as well because I don't think these things are actually totally separated. It's about digital assets and the ecosystem and the framework and U.S. leadership around these issues. And then there's stable coins and crypto and CBDCs, and we can discuss all of that. But you mentioned what the Europeans are doing. It's a good chance for me to turn to my colleague Ananya Kumar. This is a focus of our work at the Atlantic Council, Transatlantic Organization, thinking about U.S. leadership in the world, the role of the dollar in the world. So Ananya, if you could just briefly present the latest findings we have and then we're going to dive back into the domestic issues, the bill, and then go back out to the international context. Ananya, over to you. So last November, uh, the Geoeconomic Center launched a cryptocurrency regulation tracker, which looks at regulatory developments in 45 economies around the world. Um, and we looked at four different kinds of actors. We looked at financial institutions, we looked at issuers, we looked at exchanges, um, and we looked at service providers and miners across the world. Um, and every country in our tracker currently is assigned one of three regulatory statuses. So crypto asset activity can either be fully legal, it can be partially banned, which usually means that some countries have banned crypto assets for payments, uh, or it can be fully banned. And a good example of that, of course, is China. Um, and uh, the question is, how is crypto activity around the world? Uh, how do countries even begin to regulate it? What are the activities they're looking at? Uh, so we looked at taxation licensing policy, often the first ways that countries regulate crypto. We looked at re registration policy. Uh, we looked at consumer protection issues. And we looked at AML CFT issues as sort of the four broad criteria across these 45 jurisdictions. Uh, what we found was that out of 45 jurisdictions, in about 20 of them, crypto asset activity was fully legal. In 17, it was partially banned. And in eight, it was fully banned. Uh, and a full ban doesn't necessarily mean that no crypto asset activity is happening in that jurisdiction. There's a sort of a negative correlation there uh, that we found. Uh, but stable coins are often the next frontier of crypto asset regulation in a lot of economies. Uh, in the U.S., obviously, as we're talking about, there's been uh, quite a lot of discussion about stable coins that we'll get into. Uh, but in the EU, in the U.K., in Thailand, uh, in many jurisdictions around the world, they constitute sort of what legislatures everywhere are talking about. 
A good example, obviously, is the EU uh, and Mika, which is the market in crypto assets bill, uh, was passed uh, last year, became law this year. Uh, it's going into enforcement in 2024, 2025. Uh, what it does, it creates a licensing and a governance regime for crypto asset activity uh, for all EU countries. Uh, it addresses this big issue that EU states were having, which is that every country was making its own legislation, uh, and it creates sort of a common floor for all of them. Uh, but I want us to go back to sort of US activity uh, and, and the specifics of, of uh, the bill itself. Uh, we addressed FTX in our sort of opening comments, all of us did, and the bill also looks at some of the issues that FTX raised, which was a commingling of customer and company funds uh, in the digital asset uh, realm. And uh, that's something that has existed in traditional finance at, um, for a very long time, and you both have careers in traditional finance. And we've reasserted uh, the commingling point many times across crises. So uh, I just want to talk about how the bill addresses that. Uh, Congressman Hill, to you first. Well, certainly this idea that uh, we've seen a lot of digital asset uh, uh, players that are holding themselves out as an exchange or they're creating digital assets uh, or uh, trying to build their digital ecosystem where they produce their own stable coin effectively, make a market in it, nobody knows what the value of it is, uh, how it's uh, characterized, how it's overseen. And that was a big challenge in the FTX collapse was people loaned against something they didn't even understand the value on. And a lot of sophisticated players too. So yeah, it's gonna rival the losses back in the dot-com boom when it's all said and done. We try to address that by defining first and foremost what is stable, how is it defined. They have to have an audit, they have monthly attestation, they have exposure of their liquidity. This is something that's not the case in stable coins today. Uh, those are high federal uh, standards. We also don't facilitate commingling uh, of it. Uh, and there's a separation, obviously, between a dealer and exchange and the uh, stable coin um, uh, promoter. Uh, and you can be, uh, in our bill, in our draft bill, you can be a uh, bank or non-bank stable coin issuer. You have to meet that same high federal floor of those standards and you may also have a state pathway. You could have a state uh, license to do that subject to federal oversight and then federal enforcement. So I want to pick up on that state federal point because that seems to be a sticking point right now in the yeah. legislation. And I'll ask you first, Congressman Helm, then you, Congressman Himes. How do you avoid a situation of jurisdiction chopping, mm -hmm. regulatory arbitrage? Yeah. Okay, there's more lax requirements in this state, so I'm going to license right. there, and there's not federal oversight to create some standard here. Yeah, well, I know Jim will agree on this point. That is a, that is a key, uh, it's a real key issue for this bill draft uh, between uh, uh, the work that uh, then-Chair Maxine Waters and Ranking Member McHenry did last summer and last September in working with both the Fed and the Treasury. Uh, to try to get this right, because we do want to facilitate a state pathway, but to quote my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, we don't want any race to the bottom. And in my view, this draft doesn't facilitate that. It has a high federal minimum floor of standards uh, that uh, states certainly can license people and they can add requirements, but they have to meet these federal requirements and then that in turn is subject to Federal Reserve uh, review uh, or um, Federal Reserve enforcement uh, of, uh, of, this, of this particular statute. So I think we uh, prohibit that race to the bottom that some of my colleagues have talked about and we have, but we have it the ability, the ability for a state like New York to facilitate innovation as the world's uh, you know, large dollar-based financial center. We want uh, action in New York to be uh, encouraged. Yeah, and we see so much activity happening in New York already. Yeah. Uh, Congressman Himes, to you, your reaction, your response, does that meet your expectation? Yeah, I mean, two things to say. Number one, we always have these arguments uh, when we're talking about the regulation of any financial product, exactly what is the relationship between the federal government and the state. This is not a new conversation. And in fact, the answer is very different depending on the products. In this country, for historical reasons, not necessarily for great reasons, but for <laughs> historical reasons, we have federal banks that are completely, and brokerages and, and that are completely regulated at the federal level. And then we have property and casualty insurers that are completely regulated at the state level. And of course, you got a spectrum there. So this is a familiar conversation. And, and, and the more important point I want to make is something that hasn't come up. 
Um, if we're talking about stable coins on something that we agree, and I think the world generally agrees on, which is that every stable coin that purports to be worth a dollar, let's just say, in fact has a liquid dollar in reserve backing it, I get a lot calmer about the outcome of this thing. I mean, we, we, we talk about bank regulation. Banks are inherently unstable entities because banks take a dollar, they keep five cents, and they lend out 95 cents, and they tell the guy who put that dollar in the bank, anytime you want, come get that dollar. That is an inherently unstable uh, uh, system. Uh, a property and casualty insurer, right? We saw this in Hurricane Andrew, right? If you, you can write lots of insurance, and, if you, so, and they don't have adequate reserves. Oops, you've got a problem. If there's a liquid dollar there and I can get it back, I get a lot less tense about precisely where we land, so long, of course, as that we're confident that you know, somebody is making sure that, in fact, that liquid dollar is there. That's a small regulatory problem relative to the large regulatory problem associated with regulating fractional banking. That makes sense. And the way this bill does that mix of cash, T-bills, the sort of way that you would say on percentages, we feel comfortable within 24 hours or 48 hours, you can redeem this at par, essentially. Is that right? Which is also worthy of a little scrutiny, if I can just insert 30 seconds here. We just had four bank failures associated with changes in pricing on United States treasuries. So when we say you can back with the United States treasuries, yeah. You know, French and I are of a generation, uh, actually, uh, unlike most of the people watching this, where we remember high inflation rates, we right? Do. And so, you know, we got to be cognizant of the fact that just because you say there's a liquid dollar there, that's not worth it. Yeah. You know, that, that should be scrutinized if you're talking about treasuries and that sort yeah. of thing. Congressman Howie. No, I agree with that. I, I, I mean, I, I support uh, increased transparency here. I, I agree with everything Jim just said. I would even support if the bill had an inner day valuation. So I think that's, oh, that's technically possible. I've had members mention that to me. It's a, for this exact reason to even build confidence on that. Because these payment stable coins, and we should put the emphasis on the word payment. Yeah. This is for a payment to be used on a blockchain in an application that might be a B2B or it might be a B2C application. Uh, and we want them to be uh, of impeccable design and you shouldn't have to be second guessing it. That's why we don't, uh, you know, we don't uh, really facilitate algorithmic stable it's, it's, coins. Yeah. Uh, there's been a little irony in that market recently, uh, uh, but uh, we want this to be the base case of what a stable coin is. I'm not, that's not to say there aren't uh, advances that people might make in the future when there's higher confidence, but this, this market requires us walking before we run. Uh, and it, it does remind me of dot-com. We had a framework uh, between uh, March of 2000 and October of 2002. Uh, they were in a framework, whether it's web uh, van or pets.com or CMGI or whatever that one was. Everybody was writing covered call options on. The bottom line was five and a half trillion dollars was lost. So we want to make sure we have that this base case right. If we get this base case right, where I propose we do no harm, we actually facilitate innovation in the U.S. We attract capital back to the U.S. We facilitate the use of the dollar as this token basis. All that will benefit innovation in the United States. Investors will be better protected. They'll be protected from fraud. And I would argue that if both these bills were in place, our stablecoin legislation and our regulatory framework, you would not have had an FTX last year. Well, that's a very interesting point. And let me ask you one more on the domestic side, and then we'll turn back to the international. Also, we have questions coming in. Folks can use askac.org, and we'll get to as many as we can in about the 25 minutes we have left. So you mentioned FTX and preventing FTX. You also mentioned algorithmic stablecoins. And of course, we talked about Terra Luna in the beginning, right. how does the bill actually distinguish between algorithmic stable coins, fiat peg stable coins, and is there really a moratorium? Meaning, can you now issue, if the bill was passed, if this was law, algorithmic stable coins in the US? Well, it wouldn't be a stable coin. So under a different framework, essentially. So we're, 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 we're describing in this bill what a stable coin is. We're also uh, sensitive to provisional authorities for people to have a transition period, uh, but we think that's another value of the debate we're having in Congress, which is that people begin to see the framework here and the parameters about what a good one looks like, where there's some political consensus. So that we hope we transmit that consensus, not only through our votes on the House floor, and hopefully to law, 
But we also transmit this consensus to the regulatory agencies, to the Treasury, to other markets, uh, that this is you know, the best thinking that we have today. But as Jim points out, this is a fledgling emerging market. To say that we're gonna project the future is to say that Paul Krugman could predict the future for uh, the internet back in 1998 when he said it had no more value than a fax machine. So these things are, these are emerging trends, right? And we wanna, we really we're truly- pull up that article and share it with everyone. Yeah, please, please. We really want to do no harm, but we don't wanna disadvantage our country, our capital markets, our innovators, our investors. Yeah. Congressman, on that, where the executive is, where the Biden administration is versus where Congress is, what's happened, of course, we had the President's Working Group on stable coins in that report, but this is now back in 2021. So where you see the conversations between the administration and Congress on this issue? Well, um, the President's Working Group uh, proposals obviously informed our thinking, and uh, if I recall correctly, I think that working group suggested that only uh, chartered banks should issue stable right, coins. Yeah. We've obviously varied from that, um, which is fine. That's, uh, that's how this place is supposed to work. So, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, conversation right now is more between uh, the committee um, and the regulators, and the conversations are happening, I think, formally and informally, as we all work, I think, in good faith. Uh, okay. You know, I think everybody's working in good faith to figure this stuff out. The truth is, five years ago, if you'd said the word stablecoin in the, uh, you know, in the Financial Services Committee, much less in the United States Congress, people would have looked at you funny. So this is, you know, as much a process of everybody getting educated as it is uh, uh, us figuring out exactly the right balance. And, 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 of course, this happens to be a field like the Internet back in 98, 99, in which the amount of high and the amount of you know revolutionary rhetoric and everything will be different. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it, it's 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 hard to really sort of stay focused on 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 the reality of what it was doing. But it's been a very constructive conversation. I, I just have to agree with you on that. I was at the IMF several years ago when this issue was first emerging, and the conversations with House Financial Services in particular are the most du nuanced. The briefings we do, you know, the really getting to the nitty gritty of the issue in a sort of bipartisan fashion, which is welcome. And I know from the work we do around the world, it's seen. You know, people say. They watch the hearings, they watch the subcommittee hearings, they understand the level of work that's going into getting this right. But it was that early international work that caused, I think, U.S. policymakers at the Treasury and the Fed and on Capitol Hill to begin to ask questions. Yeah. They're not promoting anything. Yeah. Yeah. But we asked questions, we asked questions of Secretary Mnuchin, yeah. Chairman Powell in those days. We took uh, testimony around the whole Libra that mania. <laughs> and But that was a... Uh, huge part of our educational, bringing the House Financial Services Committee, both Democrat and Republicans, up to standard on understanding these issues. I think that benefited us, those early discussions that we had back in 2018 and 2019. Agreed. Ananya, over to you, sure. speaking of the international dimension. Thank you, Congressman. I just want to zoom out a little bit and talk about goals. And Congressman Hill, you uh, talked about attracting innovation and talent into the American economy. Uh, I just want to understand, and I know we don't want to be overly prescriptive about our goals with Bud 3, but why do you think it's important to establish rules of the road? Why do you think we need more clarity? And can this bill in any way advance American competitiveness and America's standing? Well, Jim and I have a, a bill in Congress called the 21st Century Dollar Act. Uh, we both believe very strongly in uh, the role the United States plays constructively in um, uh, military affairs, diplomatic affairs, economic policy affairs. And so at the heart of that is the American system, our rule of law, uh, our governance system, but it's also our capital markets. Well, uh, Distributed ledger technology, the use of blockchain is going to affect commerce globally, trade globally, and consumer behavior globally. Well, we don't want to put ourselves at a disadvantage there then. So we need to have those initial fundamental steps to try to get this right so that we're competitive and that we don't disadvantage our country and our innovators and that we attract our share of that, that capital. I believe our legal system is superior to any I don't want to say superior to any other legal system, that's too, too aggressive. But it is uh, one of the most proven, transparent legal systems in the world. Uh, and no matter what your commercial application is, I think you're better off in this market than many others. Congressman Himes, I want to give you the opportunity. Yeah, well, um, French is absolutely right uh, in what he says about, uh, about um, you know, the importance of maintaining dollar primacy and, and keeping our capital markets really the envy of the world. The, the, the thing I would add to that is the other massive strategic advantage uh, that has accrued to the United States over time is that we have been the place where innovation happens. 
Um, and, and again, I'm a skeptic here, particularly in the realm of um, mechanisms of exchange. You know, I, I, I can walk into a store in Zarka, Jordan, and buy $60 worth of stuff and wave a piece of plastic over an electronic device, and boom, it's done, mm -hmm. right? I, I'm not waking up every morning and saying, the problem with the world today is that I just mm -hmm. don't have a mechanism to pay for stuff, <laughs> right? Uh, and um, so I'm a, and yeah. you know, Bitcoin and all of the other yeah. digital assets, which are yeah. really an opportunity to invest in Bob Bob's life, fine, I get it. However, um, one thing I'm, I'm, I'm relatively sure about that, I'm also relatively sure that my skepticism will be proven wrong in certain areas, and that the broader question uh, of the blockchain, this is where it gets really interesting, you know, issues of provenance, issues of ownership, issues of transfer of value into you know, uh, isolated areas, uh, trust, um, you know, we have uh, primarily immigrant populations in this country who fundamentally don't trust the banking system because they come from countries where you shouldn't trust the banking system. Mm -hmm. So um, again, I am a skeptic on issues of mechanisms of exchange and, and stablecoin, but I also know that I'll be wrong in certain areas and that there is a huge amount of value there waiting to be innovated into existence and, and we need to make sure that that happens here uh, rather than somewhere else. And you know, we talked and Ananya asked about this sort of proactive side of stable coins and you know, dollar backed stable coins all around the world, which is standard setting and international leadership. But there's a defensive side, meaning when my conversations with central banks and finance ministries around the world, some of them are concerned about dollar backed stable coins, meaning you know, we call about dollarization in the economy. Now there's a form of digital dollarization in your economy, meaning, and this goes back to the original Libra conversation, mm -hmm. is there a potential where these dollar-backed stable coins privately issued can start flooding economies? And I wonder how you think about the legislation in that context. Well, that's an interesting, interesting question. Um, you know, I find that uh, this issue of the countries that are, quote, concerned about the dollar, uh, which has been the currency since World War II, eight decades now, uh, the ones that express the most concern about that are when we behave poorly here, uh, which we are right now vis-a-vis -vis the size of our budget deficits, for example, or they are behaving, behaving badly and are sanctioned by the United Nations, the EU, or the United States. So. Uh, the, if, if, if the complainers are North Korea, China, Russia, and Iran, gosh, I really, I'm sorry, you know. Uh, <laughs> it just it breaks my heart to say that this is somehow hurting. <coughs> but I think our view is we want that reserve currency as advantages to the United States, but also as advantages to the world because of that legal system and the capital market system that adjoin it. It's not us exporting some United States hedge money or jingoistic point of view. It's, it is a reserve currency. We want to make sure that we do our part right, which is to run our fiscal affairs appropriately, uh, and that we have that legal system and capital market system that come with it. And that's not to say that uh, the euro isn't a very effective way to make a payment you know, in Europe, uh, and, uh, and, and you'll see that expand. It's already 40% of payments there, for example. And that's one thing we see, which is that if the U.S. doesn't innovate, create clarity around this as well, then companies will just move to other countries and set up stable coins in other countries. They can still be dollar back. There are ways around it, but then sure, we won't have as much yeah. oversight. Ananya, back to you. Um, speaking of the dollar, and, and Congressman, you, you talked about sort of our domestic policy affecting um, and our domestic regulations affecting uh, stablecoin uptake in other countries, adoption of crypto assets in other countries. Uh, but there's also a lot of conversation around dollar hegemony, which is what you're alluding to with mm -hmm. your point about China, Iran, Russia, and uh, alternative currencies like the yuan coming in, uh, in, in in play, but also the digital forms of all those alternative currencies coming in play here. Um, can we talk a little bit about how stable coins could challenge or deter dollar dominance? And Congressman Himes, I'll start with you here. Yeah, so um, today they can't, right? I mean, you've got trillions of dollars uh, in circulation, and I think, as you pointed out, the market cap of all the stable coins, some of which are not dollars, is $130 billion. It's It's not even a rounding error on... Uh, and, and, again, we can't get too caught up in everything is different and we're, we're at the start of the revolution here. The truth is that, you know, uh, the primary drivers of reserve currency are going to be two things. Number one 
if I'm a global financial player and I want to secure some value for a period of time, relatively, where is the right place to do this? Should I put it in dollars or should I put it in sterling or whatever the alternatives are? And uh, uh, French is exactly right that, you know, we, we don't want to lose that relative competition. But I'm not too worried that, you know, the guy in Dubai right now who is comparing sterling with the UK and the UK economic problems or the challenges of China is going to say, yeah, I'm going to put all my value, my wealth into either sterling or China. But we need to make sure that that relative calculation doesn't change over time. And then the other thing, which we tend to ignore sometimes, you know, in terms of the maintenance of reserves, this gets boring really quickly. But I you know, a country come talk to the right players. A country, <laughs> a country, exactly. Um, a country is wise to keep a basket of reserves that reflects its trade. Yep. So this idea that just because you know there is a uh, you know, sterling or a euro stable coin. I mean, that would, you know, that would at the retail level have implications, but that all of a sudden countries are going to radically change their reserve uh, holdings or that people are going to make a less rational uh, decision about where they store their value, I think is mistaken. You know, that said, again, you know, over time, relative financial irresponsibility or uh, uh, an, uh, an environment that is not conducive to innovation will damage our standing. Congressman Hell, your response? I don't. I don't disagree with that. I think that uh, I think the basket of, of looking at, at trade is right, uh, but you're not going to want to hold uh, the RMB of China long haul. So it may be uh, digital or non-digital a payment, but you're going to want to convert that into a uh, a currency that has a legal system and is freely tradable and available to be used worldwide, and that's not the RMB. In fact, it has no legal system. It's an authoritarian government. It's a surveillance state. Uh, your information is stolen, and that's not a freely exchangeable currency. And so I don't promote, for example, that just because uh, it's the second largest economy for now in the world, we'll see if it can stay there. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't support it being advanced in the IMF basket at a higher percentage because I don't think it meets the standard of the kind of currency that should be expanded in that basket compared to uh, the pound or the euro, for example, or the yen for that matter. So you brought up China and there's another related issue that we often talk about in this context, which is CBDC, central bank digital currency. Um, and this is something we do a lot of work on at the Atlantic Council. We track developments around the world. There's now over 65 that are in advanced phase of development, about 130 that are in research phase of development, and 18 of the G20 are moving forward on CBDC. But Congressman Himes, I want to start with you. You did work on this in the last Congress. Mm -hmm. How do you see this from a roll of the dollar perspective? And vis-a-vis -vis the conversation we're having today, the trade-off between stable coins and CBDC, or if it doesn't need to be a trade-off, if they can complement each other in some way? Yeah, it, it certainly doesn't need to be a trade-off. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of noise around CBDC right now. Um, and, and the conclusion of my white paper was pretty simple. It was like, look, as you point out, lots of other countries are exploring it. Let's keep exploring it. Again, I just don't want to wake up someday and find out that there is a really attractive retail-oriented uh, euro CBDC or sterling CBDC. Could happen. Could happen. So. My own view is, again, I'm deeply skeptical that there is a radical need for entirely new payment mechanisms out there. There's lots of them out there backed by big brand names, uh, the banks, et cetera, including the brand name of the United States government. Um, but I do think that there is likely to be a market uh, for probably for certain populations, as I referred to earlier, that are maybe a little skeptical of the banking system. Uh, I, look, I point to remittances. Remittances right now is a business just crying out for disintermediation and, by the way, disruption, because fees around remittances, if I'm working in Connecticut and sending money home to Central America, I'm going to pay an 8, 9, 10 percent fee. That is, that should be disrupted. And my guess is that a lot of those populations are going to say, you know, I'm not sure about all of these. So, uh, you know, commercially backed. Uh, stable coins. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, again, history is important here, right? You know, we went from a world in which there were all sorts of fiat currencies issued by the states, issued by private banks, et cetera. Now we have a dollar. Uh, and so, again, I'm not promoting it and saying we need to do it now, but let's not get left behind because there may be a, a market for it. And by the way, the le last thing I want to say on this topic is a lot of the challenges to a CBDC or a lot of the concern with it is that now there's the potential that the government knows what you're doing. Well, guess what? Today there is a pretty substantial potential that the government knows what you do. If they want to and they get the appropriate warrants and stuff, they will go to Citibank, they will go to, you know, and, and get that information. 
You're concerned about the Chinese, you know, who don't have to get a warrant. They'll get that information if they want to as well. So again, my, my approach is not we need to do it. It's let's, let's not get left behind. And a previous version of the bill had research towards CBDC, not to do it or not do it, but research and explore it. This latest version does not. Uh, your reaction to that or something that could be handled separately, perhaps? Well, the Fed, the Fed has, uh, you know, and Lael Brainerd in particular, when she was at the Fed, was doing a lot of work and a lot of thinking about this. And so I think they continue to think about it and do research, and that's fine with me. Again, we've had this long, appropriate, uh, you know, kind of a tiff with the Fed about exactly what their authorities are. I think there's now a consensus that they're not going to issue a U.S. dollar CBC without, without telling yeah. us about it or getting authorization yeah. from it. But, uh, you know, again, I think a lot of people are thinking about it. And what, what I think it will take what it may take again this has become very politicized yeah. for reasons I don't think are terribly smart you know if we do wake up one morning and, and there is a sterling CBDC that is really attractive or a euro CBDC I think that'll cause us to say hey wait a minute are we getting left behind here yeah. and should we move a little faster than we are and it's important to distinguish two types of CBDC we're talking about retail CBDC how you and I buy a cup of coffee uh, but wholesale CBDC has also taken off in the past several years and what we see in our research is this reaction in part to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the G7 sanctions response meaning there's a double of interest in wholesale cross-border bank-to-bank CBDC payments in just the last 18 months. And there, and to you, Congressman Hill, I do think there's an issue of dollar competitiveness, the role of the dollar, not so much as the reserve currency, but the financial architecture, the financial plumbing of which relies on the dollar, SWIFT system and, and others. Well, I, I don't really disagree with what, you know, Jim's said. I mean, my view about issuing a CBDC, I think, is an Article I power. Democrat Jake Achenkloss from Boston, Mass, and I have a bill that requires that. There are other bills in Congress that also suggest that. Also, I think this idea that uh, somebody's going to use a CBDC at retail and bank at the Fed is just uh, borders on, I, will, I won't use an adjective since we're here broadcast internationally. <laughs> I mean, it's just unlikely, I would say. Yeah, I'll, I, sound, I'll, I'll no, channel no, Charlie Munger, that. you know, and say I, I think it's oh. unlikely in a more cleaned up way. But, um, and why is that? It's because of exactly what Jim Himes said, which is you can go to the smallest burg in the, in the universe and uh, tap uh, your a card on a payment device and your payment's done. So in a big, thorough, robust, developed country like the continent of Europe or Australia or the United States, I just don't, I don't see that as needed. Uh, and then we have to remember that in uh, the global south and developing countries, their decision about their telecom system is already what turns on their financial system. And if we let China do both those things, it's, it's heavily negative, which is why I don't support Chinese telecommunications technology or predatory lending. I'm glad Janet Yellen's in India today discussing both, um, but wholesale. Uh, and also one other point, remember the, the CDBDC is for a, on a blockchain. Well, I, I don't know of any blockchain retail payment systems floating around, except maybe inside a uh, web three based activity in gaming or some other. Now they're gonna grow. And that's where I think these payment stable coins become a safe, sound, dollar-based gateway to that to let us determine uh, if in the future a more broad CBDC has value at retail. And then I fully expect our central banks uh, to use distributed ledger technology. I wouldn't necessarily call it a CBDC if they have a tokenized payment. Yeah. I mean, is Zelle, uh, you, know, you know, will Zelle become a tokenized payment? Will uh, at the wholesale level, will Onyx at J.P. Morgan Chase be? It might be tokenized, but would you call it? What would you know? It's an internal tokenized payment, but is it a real-time payment, or do you want to really call it a, a to, you know, a, a, a CBDC type payment? You make so a there's a good point yeah. just on the naming and getting too far down these rabbit holes. If it is, but I, I, it the bottom line is we. This is why I think we walk before we run, and these two framework bills that we've talked about this morning are would allow us to determine the best course of action for the future. And all CBDCs that we research are intermediated through the financial system, even China's, but you know, and you can believe how that works with their four banks and others. Right. But it's important to your point, no one is waking up in the US or in Europe and the UK and having a direct account uh, with the Bank of England, the ECB, or the right. Fed. 
Uh, so that's going to be different if and when it ever happens. Ananya, I want to turn to you so we can get some of the questions yeah. from the floor in the I'll minutes left. I'll also add one last point, which is that uh, as we do crypto asset regulatory research and CBDC research, we actually think that those develop in parallel to each other, and countries don't think of them as an either-or option. They often try to develop a regulatory regime and also start research into CBDCs at the same time. That's something we found to be true. Uh, but it's time to move to uh, the audience questions, so please send over your questions. And uh, this is a question I uh, like, and we've talked about sort of banking failures that have happened recently. So I think this will call back to a few points we've made. Uh, which is how will the gradual adoption of stable coins affect the scope of monetary policy and can it substantially disrupt international flow of finance and capital? Well, I'll start, you know, complicated question. Uh, because they're dollar for dollar and they're not, uh, you know, how they participate in the fractional reserve system and then relate to uh, monetary policy is something I think that's an open question. It's a question I think the Fed has looked at closely. But if they're used as a payment stable coin and they're fully backed by you know, liquid short-term treasuries and cash, then in my judgment, they don't really facilitate that change. They're actually just a new payment rail, this time on a blockchain issued by a bank or a non-bank as a payment service provider, if you want to use a European term for it. So it's, you know, it's not a radical step into disintermediation at this stage. And I believe we've got the regulatory oversight to watch that, you know, obviously very carefully. Um, I'll move to the next question so we can get more of them. But given the challenges of passing legislation as split Congress and long timelines, uh, and as well as issues with compliance with existing uh, rules, are there any executive branch authorities that you think need to be leveraged more or mm. differently uh, given the authority that they currently have. You want to attack that one first? Well, partly, partly what you're seeing here is the Congress asserting its authority uh, and keeping up with steps taken by the executive, right? So the president's working group was an early, uh, uh, an early uh, uh, intercession into this debate. And, of course, we have a very aggressive and knowledgeable chairman of the SEC. Gary Gensler, of course, taught digital currencies up at MIT. And so... Uh, and he, he's been very aggressive in his beliefs around what's a security and what's not. I don't need to get into that. But the point is, we have been spurred because we do believe at the end of the day it's the Article I authority, the Congress that ought to be driving this to say, hey, we better, uh, we better catch up here. And truth is we've been burdened by, uh, you know, as I sort of think about and you're sensing a lot of agreement between this Democrat and this Republican, we were a little bit burdened by what I sometimes like to joke with my uh, friends who are, you know, professional lobbyists in this town. You could not have crafted a worse introduction to digital assets than what happened here. I mean, I, some, I sometimes say, you know, if you were writing the screenplay, you know, the evil people who wanted to make sure that the Congress was never on top of this would have, would have started with, get me Zuckerberg <laughs> and have him pitch a global currency run by Facebook, you know. And then the next chapter would have been, you know, get me this 24-year-old genius in a T-shirt who yeah. contributes lots of money to congressional campaigns and have him commit the fraud of the century. So, I mean, you, the, the screenplay about how to poison the Congress on a complicated technical issue was played out. Now, the good news is we're sort of overcoming this, but it, we, were, we were way behind the eight ball for a long time on the topic. Well said, and let's go. We'll go to final audience question. Sure, and uh, th th that one's about state versus federal. Again, I'm sorry we keep coming back That's to it, good. but this is a big point uh, to make. But essentially, the question asks uh, about what happens when states don't want to regulate. Could they give up authority to the Fed to be the regulator? Could they sign a memorandum, as I read in the bill? Well, that's an old draft. Yeah. Uh, that's not the current draft. But a state doesn't have to, uh, you know, empower. Uh, a blockchain-based stable coin payment mm -hmm. service company. They can or they don't have to. You know, they don't have to do, we don't make them do it. And so if that's the case, entities in that jurisdiction would be federally regulated. They'd be either a federal non-bank uh, payment uh, stable coin uh, issuer or a, uh, a bank yeah. stable coin issuer. So I don't think anyone is disadvantaged in interstate commerce. All we're saying is if a state really wants to make this a business strategy for them, Web3 is important. This is an important step in Web3, they think, they believe. We facilitate a way for them to have a path, but have high federal standards and federal oversight. So we're almost out of time. I just want to give you both a chance, final word, and I'll frame it like this and start with you, Congressman Himes, and then you, Congressman Hill. We're sitting here a year from now. I hope you come back. Is there stablecoin 
legislation that's passed and signed by the president, and what does that look like one year from now? More clarity, less clarity, or same status quo? Um, we'll let uh, my my friend Hill, who's in the House majority right now, have the concluding view. Uh, the minority the minority view. Uh, uh, I, I actually think we've got a good shot at passing stablecoin legislation. I want to keep driving home the point that the stakes are lower than they are with fractional banking or the insurance industry. We're mm -hmm. talking about a dollar, something that purports to be a dollar that by law will be backed by a dollar. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean there's not room for, 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 for funny business, but there's a lot less room. So I, I'm pretty confident on stablecoin. You know, it's interesting, the, the topic of the market architecture bill, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that gets a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. So I guess if I were putting my money on the table right now, my uh, my my uh, my stable coin on the table right now, I would say stable coin, yes, a little heavier lift on market architecture, but fingers crossed. Okay. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, a year from now we'll have uh, a stable coin bill signed into law and we'll have uh, consensus on the regulatory architecture. Let me tell you why. Uh, if the SEC under Jay Clayton as chairman or under Gary Gensler as chairman could effectively use uh, exemptive relief uh, they could have done that, and they've chosen not to, both under Republican and Democratic leadership. It's very confused. It's hurt innovation, and uh, ruling this market by enforcement is a mistake. Uh, FTX catalyst, that's the second catalyst. Uh, the confusion about what is a good stable coin, the third catalyst. So I think in regulatory framework, we have a, a, a catalyst, plus the FSOC has asked for a uh, statute, asked for law. The President's Working Group has asked for a law uh, so I believe the Biden administration at the end of the day is supportive of us legislating here. And finally, there's action in the Senate. Uh, Senators Gillibrand and Loomis, uh, uh, and among others, Senator Haggerty, others are very interested in this. So we do have uh, colleagues over in the, in, the, uh, in the Senate that want to engage too. That gives us the possibility of, of making a law here and having President Biden uh, be able to contribute uh, a year from now a much better ecosystem for digital assets in the United States. Thank you for that, and thank you for mentioning the Senate. It came to my mind towards the end. I said yeah. we haven't brought up the Senate. Well, occasionally, we, we, <laughs> occasionally so. we will not. <laughs> so, <laughs> at least be raised before we conclude. I want to thank you both. I want to thank you for your work on this, for the leadership of House Financial Services in a bipartisan fashion that I think has really been a model on how to approach these complicated issues. And I want to thank you for starting your week with us. Ananya, thanks to you and the work you lead here at the Atlantic Council on Digital Assets and Digital Currency. Folks can find that work on the Atlantic Council Future of Money page through the Geoeconomic Center. And I want to, in the spirit of two members of Congress here, take a point of personal privilege. This is the last public event we are doing for a few weeks at the Atlantic Councils. We go on a brief summer recess. And I want to thank the events team who work behind the scenes tirelessly. Over 800 events per year happen at the Atlantic Council. They do it smoothly. They help us communicate this to the entire world. We have people watching all around the globe this morning. And we want to say thanks to you. Thanks to everyone watching. Have a great rest of your week. <laughs>